Okay, so tonight's lesson is going to be about three, you know, three really primary things of the downswing. You could go on all night about like, you know, from transition through the ball and all that, you know, as far as what's most important and what you're really looking for. Um, and, you know, I'm using Tiger when I think that some of the footage I have of Tiger when he's at his best here. Um, and um, when he was, you know, he, he was the best. He wasn't just the best player in the world. He was by far and away the best ball striker in the world. And when somebody is that in this generation, you want to take notice of it. And there's really nobody even close right now, even if you look at Spieth and, and some of these players that are trying to catch up. There's nobody uh, that's even close to where he was at his peak right now, when he was at his peak, like right here. And um, your golf swing's not going to look like Tigers, doesn't need to look like Tigers, but what we're going to try to pull off of what Tigers doing now and some of the things that he even did before, I'm going to try to pull up a few swings of what he's doing. When I say before, actually, like this is before and what he's doing now that is causing some issues that I could think causes the everyday player issues or I wouldn't bring it up. And, um, and it's also a good way to get injured, um, with some of the things that he's been doing, uh, you know, of late. So, um, when you look at Tiger back in this kind of when he was really dominating, when he's winning, you know, major after major after major, just, you know, best player on the planet by far and away, uh, best ball striker on the planet by far and away, uh, one of the things, if you remember back, uh, some of the, the new golfers may not remember on here, but the, the, the generation from mine and, and so forth and up, uh, they will know. And one of the things that's always stood out about Tiger is he always had a pause in his swing. So if we go up to the, the top of the swing, when you get back right here, you'll see the shaft just, now I stopped it here, obviously that's a full pause, that's not what he's doing, but you'll see the, what I want to do is show you when he gets in this zone here, that um, the shaft will, it won't be blurry. If it was blurry, that means he would be violently pulling down on the shaft. And uh, and what you'll see with Tiger is the shaft stays, it actually is at, at its slowest speed is in transition. So when he took it back, he had his, this part of the swing, it gradually got faster all the way back. And then all of a sudden, right in here, it became at the slowest point. Now, it's, you're, you're talking just, you know, a split frame here. You know, it's only shooting, you know, this thing's probably shooting at 12 frames, and I'm slowing it down more than that. But in general, you know, this thing's not shooting, uh, maybe 30 frames, but it's it's not shooting at a really fast frame rate, which is great, because then you can really see it. If it was in slow motion, it would be really hard to see. But you'll see the club slows down in transition, and that's part of the float. And I say it all the time, but it won't go away. It's like it's not, I'll never get away from what we do. The bread and butter, what we do is pretty much every component with inside the float will help any golfer get on the right track. If you fix the float, then your containment will be better and your delivery will be better. But then once you've got the float down, uh, both the club and the body, then yeah, you can start to work on the other things uh, as you go along. But it, I, I've said it, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times on this thing, uh, is uh, that uh, you fix your transition, you get better at golf. Now, maybe you know, there's a lot of things to golf so there's putting chipping bunker play there's a lot of things but if you just want to hit the ball better which is what most people want to do in here if you fix transition you will hit the ball better we hit it your best maybe not but because i've seen good transitions that don't hit it good but in general if you have a good transition you will hit it better than what you were relative to your talent then you can go in and start to create the other stuff but if you're working on you know other than if you're doing the bunker training but even the bunker training if you're not if you're not really solid in transition and you're not doing it right in transition, it's going to be hard for you to be solid with the timing contact point. Um, it just will be. But the timing contact point does trump everything. But to go with what we're working on uh, tonight and what everybody should be working on, really, I'd say essentially every lesson they go out would be this. You get to hear it, you slow it down, you let the body and club really come to a full rest here. Uh, that's where it's most stable. And then when it comes to a rest here with a body and club, you can start to um, deliver as one whole, you know, one way if you want to call it a package, your body and club, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. But you can deliver the club and, and the body will be in time with that uh, much more efficient than if you get up to the top, which what most people do and they get up here and they ram the club, you know, if you can... I'll try to get this up. So if they just ram the club down into your body or they try to superficially lag it, drag it back behind them or they throw it away this way or throw it that way, you're just wasting energy. And that's not what he did. You know, um, 
And so looking at the greatest ball striker, some people will talk about Hogan all they want. This Tiger Woods right here, right in this, uh, this, this few years here, was the greatest ball striker to ever step foot on the planet. And there's not anybody even close. And because you have to, you have to factor in power and accuracy. Ben Hogan was, wasn't the longest hitter on the tour. He's known for him hitting it dead straight. Well, Tiger Woods could hit a six iron, uh, his five iron as far as Hogan, literally his five iron as far back in this generation, if he wanted to, he could hit his five iron as far as Hogan hit his, you know, three wood or even driver potentially. Same ball. Um, it, it just, it, it just did not even comp compare. I mean, when Nicholas did it, you know, Nicholas did it in the same generation that Hogan was, he was 70 yards longer than Hogan was. And that was Jack Nicholas. Well, this is somebody that's a whole different level athlete. And but if you take the principles, even what Jack Nicholas did, he had the same thing. He had this kind of pause in that transition delay, and then he could collect everything and work his way under it and, and, and stripe it. So he starts with just getting everything collected at the top in the float. And I'm trying to. So there's lessons where I'm going to go around it, where I'm talking about other things like we have. But in general, if you want to know the essence of what we do, you better pause at the top because anybody that's on here, I don't care if you're on the tour or if you're uh, I don't care if you're a 120 shooter you pause and transition you you start to slow down and collect everything in transition you come out of it you will be better now then we start to try to get better and better and we go oh what's the next move and all that but then we forget that the the main thing is to do that you have to have that club and body slow down so they can connect with each other and um I can't tell you how many times I see players that they even heard me say it a thousand times. I'll come to a golf school, they get here, and they're they don't they're not doing it at all. And it's like the essence of what we do. So you have to get the club and body. And the more you see players on tour now, the more delay you're seeing in transition. So just turn your TV set any tour right now. The longest hitters have the most delay in transition. The best ball strikers have the most delay in transition. And it doesn't necessarily have to be mean that they have the um, tempo. It's not that we're talking about swinging in slow motion going back. That actually makes it worse. Then you're going to naturally speed up and 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 get worse through uh, in transition because you'll try to hammer out of it. So it's better to go back normal or a sharp brisk, you know, kind of backswing. Uh, sharp is probably a good word for it. But then in transition, that's where the float and the slowdown comes into effect. So the body and club and can come together as one unit and then come out as one unit, and that's a big deal. So that's that's number one. Now number two is um, I'm going to go back here to the to to, to uh, set up here. We're going to draw a line right here. Hopefully this camera's pretty stable right there. And this is what it's a you know it's been a popular topic for the last ten years I'd say with really elite instructors. Now now it's not even elite instructors. Now it's just one of those things where when you talk about it that you uh, you know. Gosh, if you don't know this and you're really missing the camera's not stable, it's moving around, but this is going to be good enough for what we're doing. When you get to the top of the backswing, if you look, most amateurs even right here, the you can see his right hip or his glute is on that line right there. Um, and as you get to the top, it stays on that line. Most amateurs have already pushed the hip. They've either flexed the knee too much or and which so they'd either flex this too much. He's got some knee flex here a little bit more than what he needs, but most people will push that hip. It won't get rotated, and you'll see that on your videos if you're studying. It won't get rotated. It's kind of sticking up and out, which kind of pulls the spine and lays the spine back, which will throws the arms more vertical. It can also roll them flat. I mean, there's, it, that doesn't really matter. The, the, the club's going to be a lot of different places when you do that. It won't be uh, good for whatever you do. Having a flat club or upright club is not a problem. It's just you, what is a problem is when you block the hip. And you don't want to, amateurs do not need to lock this hip up. They don't have enough thoracic mobility as it is, which is right there. So when they lock this hip up, then you've just made that worse. So what we want to do, we want to get that hip back like Tiger's doing here. A lot of rotation in that back hip. Um, and then and it's a lot of depth. So rotation and depth are different. You could be rotating it here like this, but the depth would be pushed forward. Like, so like the hip joint is pushed forward. And I'll show a kettlebell exercise here in a minute that, that helps with that. But um, rotation and depth are different. If you picture, and, and hopefully this will explain it to everybody, depth is just straight back. It has nothing to do with, like, the rotary movement. So it has nothing to do with it. they got to respect each other. If you're only deep and you don't rotate, you're no good. 
uh, if you only rotate and you're not deep, you're no good. You're going to be not you're not going to be near as good as what you could be. So what you're trying to do with every all these great players, they're trying to get this this depth in their body in the back end, and they're trying to uh, or excuse me depth this way straight back. But then they've got the rotation that kind of counters that. And that if you can picture that, that's kind of the center row, which we always talk about through the Dow. It's ever that's the center, uh, which makes it work. Um, so now on the backswing, um, it's somewhat important. I mean, if you're taking the club back and you've got one of those, if you're all rotation and no depth, you're probably going to have issues unless you learn how to find it or adjust. You know, adjustability. We can never account for adjustability. Uh, I can't do that with players. All I can show them, the, the adjustability for one out of a thousand amateurs, what I mean is just adjustable, is if you take a, an amateur up here and they slam their hips forward or back or extended through the spine, a pro can adjust out of that. It, it's adjustability, and I'll, I'll get to show that on the, um, on the, fo the follow-up video. But they can adjust and, and, and find it, uh, not only with the shaft, but with the body and all that stuff. Uh, when an amateur does it, they don't adjust. They just swing the club straight back down. They don't adjust for anything. And that's one of the reasons if we take a step back and we go to the pause drill, or not even drill, just pausing at the top and let everything collect, it gives you time to adjust. Uh, you'll see how far off you are. But if that club goes back and down or your body, you get up to the top and your body's firing as you're trying to come down out of transition, um, good luck. You know, you're not going to, the odds on you adjusting, it's probably, I'm just making up a number, but, this is just, I'm making up a number relative to what I see of 24 years of experience of seeing 2,000 golfers per year, um, different golfers. They don't adjust. Uh, pro will, but it, the, the amateurs won't. So that's, you, you, gotta, you need to make your golf swing fairly simple and fairly efficient, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, some basic fundamentals. And that's one of them is getting the depth and the rotation at the same time. So we, as you're in transition here, so we draw this line. The average amateur, so that's the line that pros are going to hold. Every pro on the tour is going to hold that line. But if you watch the amateur, they'll push their hips forward like this, and then they'll they'll raise the back part of their spine or their neck kind of backwards. That's why you see them kind of stand up. So that's one of the reasons why they get injured. The, the lower lumbar is, in, is getting pushed forward through the hips, uh, extending forward, and then the cervical is pushing backwards. So there's this shearing energy, uh, which is not good. That's how you get injured. It's kind of like a popping a towel if you can so to speak. And those are happening at the same time, whereas a pro, they just keep the depth. So if you watch, he keeps the depth. And for, for an amateur to feel what he's doing here, now this again, we're going back to feeling real. If you put an amateur in that, this, this same thing, like uh, there was working with, I don't remember, there was a couple guys today online, we always work kind of in this area, in the transition zone. But if you look, when they see their videos, one, when, and they may be on here or not. One, their shoulder plane is half as flat as this. I mean, it's it's or twice as flat as this. Their hip pelvis isn't tilted at all. They're they're working off this now. Their arm angles a lot of times are in the right ballpark, but their bodies is just because the pelvis is pushed forward and they've kind of stood up and flattened out. And then all of a sudden you tilt them down to where the striking angles are with these pros, and they feel like they laugh at you. They think that it's it's a joke. Like there's no, I couldn't hit a ball. I'm gonna hit it fat. You know, well, yeah, you're going to hit fat because you've been hitting everything thin and weak anyway. So you're going to, you're not going to hit it fat once you get comfortable, but you're going to be, I can assure you, you're not going to be comfortable. Uh, anybody's going to be comfortable getting down like this and having this much depth in the back. There's just, there's just not many people. Um, so keeping this depth, and if you watch, they increase some of that depth. They even get steeper, but the shaft doesn't, you know. So they have this tremendous amount of depth from the back end and discipline to the plane and that's one of the, that's the reason why you're seeing that there and you can have a lot of different backswings but you have to have that depth you know that depth and discipline to the plane coming down and that's what they do and that's what he's doing here he's doing it at the very best of his career he's not doing that as much now he's still doing a lot of it but he's not doing he's not doing he doesn't have the same space that he had uh, which you'd have to see from face on but the distance away from his club is from his arms and his body and his body and club were more connected and in time here than they ever were more in his career. This, this is the best he was ever, ever swinging right here. So let's see if I can go up to, and so the last thing too uh, on this is, is you want to work, um, 
as as the body connects, and this is the last one of the three, is once the body connects out of transition, you have the depth that he is here. You can see he's not twisting. This is where everybody gets excited. They think you just want to twist. And if this guy had more hip rotation than anybody, you can see he's not twisting. He's just not even close to rotating. But from here, this is where guys get confused. Is they think they have they start seeing a player like this rotate. But what he's really doing is you're really just moving lateral through his feet. So he's just moving lateral through his feet and the natural uh, uh, the natural incline of the club, so the club's on an angle, that's what makes it look like rotation. But you do that and he's just moving forward. But the, the incline of the club, this the, the way the club's set up, the incline that it's set up on, is why you see some of this rotation. And even here you would tell he's probably more than what he, what he even likes. But that, that's a lot of reasons why you see players more rotate. It's the depth, too. What you don't realize is it's the depth this way. Two major factors more than rotation. I see guys all the time that have more rotation than this that are amateurs, and they say, I'm not rotating. It, it doesn't look like it because, but they are more rotated, and it's because their pelvis is shifted up and forward like this. So then their twist is coming more from their upper body here. And so then that means that their weight is obviously on their back foot. That's not what he's doing here. And so, you know, you have to have one before the other. It all starts back in transition. You know, I'm telling you, it's right here. And then from, from there, it's keeping depth. For most people, if they just, if they just felt anything, especially in your, just your, your progression drills, you just feel deep. Don't feel, don't feel all this stuff, this rotation stuff. That's what it gets you. Anybody, it's, if, if it was that easy, everybody would just twist on the downswing and everybody would be great. And it doesn't work that way. They Usually people get worse and worse and worse. And then they start trying, well, what if I just slide? What if I do this? They start. Then you start changing your hand action. You start, it's just a circle of failure. And where the problem was in, most likely was in transition. You didn't, you didn't get slow enough in transition. But if, then when you did, you didn't have enough depth. So when you don't have the depth here and the pelvis is pushing forward, the, the, the body and club get jammed, which causes a, you know, a flip through the ball, you know, so that's why there's no support of the core and the, and the whole body supporting this strike right here. What people look at is they look at, oh, he's tilted down and all this and his spine angle and all that. The spine angles, I don't even know what that means. There's no such a thing. I mean, you, it's either, it's the, the, there isn't. I mean, it's either you, you have depth. That's a real word. That, that's like a real label for biomechanics. You have depth. And then you have uh, you have rotation, okay, and then you have you have pitch and tilt, right? So you have pitch and then the tilt, like that axis. But there's no such thing. Spine angle that doesn't tell you anything. I mean, I don't even like I said, it doesn't even make a lot of sense. But what you want to think about, because if somebody just tries to keep their chest down, and trust me, for the last 40 years, everybody's everybody's heard of spine angle. So when they try to do this, they just try to keep their chest down. That doesn't have anything to do with your hips. Your hips. That's why I'm saying this stuff about spine angle. There's not. Doesn't make any sense. It, you you want spine angle. You better control your lower part first. Get depth. This way. Move as you're doing that out of transition. Move lateral with your feet as long as the club's in time with that. The club's got to be in time with that. And if you do those three things, you're going to be in good shape. Now. The, the downswing, it, it's going to have to work for you. I mean, every downswing, there's some players a little steeper that I've shown before, some a little flatter, some neutral like he is right here. It just There's a lot of ways to come in and be, and be great at it. But I can tell you, you have to have the depth. And most people are focusing not any on this because they can't do it, one. And, and two, they're, they're focusing on what I see is players are focused on trying to twist. They see somebody at impact say, oh, I can't see my left cheek at impact or, you know, the two butt cheek drill or whatever that does that's ridiculous everybody i see trying to spin out of it trying to which is exactly what it is spinning out of it and it's exposing your lower lumbar spine to get injured everybody that's doing that will either get injured or and they will definitely play bad golf so if you just eliminated eliminated that out of transition and went straight to depth focus on that because that will take care it won't fix all your problems but i'm telling you it will be uh, it's, it will be the Next step out of transition it becomes very, very, very important. Okay, and then another thing that that's out there is that it, it there's a the sinking and squatting are different. Is is in transition? You know, every everybody does. It. I can show you. Everybody says Tiger, you know, uh, you know, drops every player in the history of the game. Uh, 
they sink from transition. So they all they all drop down. Even here, the best he was in the world here. So if I take him back. There's not been a time in his career where he's ever played where he didn't drop under that. You'll see it right after the end. You can see it. So everybody gripes about him dropping all this. He's dropped that much his entire career. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the sinking and the space. Now we've got a conversation. Because when you squat and you try to get aggressively in squat, um, there's just the verbiage. And you have to, because I'm having to tell you this, I can demonstrate it better, but it, squatting and sinking are two different, totally different things. Sinking is more frame by frame by frame. It naturally flows like what he's doing within a swing. Now, if he just dropped one here and dropped one frame, and you see this like what Amherst will do, like Charles Barkley, for instance, he drops, and it's one frame, one shot. His whole body just kind of drops. Well, yeah, that shocks the energy of the shaft, and then you lose your timing with your brain, and it's, it's a no-go. So my point is with that is um, with, with what we're doing here is it's a gradual sinking. Like if you look at the frame rate relative, it matches up with what he's trying to do. It's gradual. So if you watch it, it matches up. When it doesn't match up, that's when we have a conversation. But space is the other problem. So we're going to back up. I'm going to show you. See if I can find. All right. So here's McElroy. I can there. He dropped more than Tiger drops. So if it, if anything, same amount. But it, it doesn't have anything to do with it. They all do it. And that's the thing. And and so if you just classify it as drop, yeah, that's probably not a good word either. But if you just measure it, yeah, he's definitely lower. But the thing is, is it matches up with what they do. Amateurs stay on the same line. If you just want to draw a line and keep your head up there, take a 100-shooter and watch them. They keep their head the same spot because they're, they're not getting any ground uh, connection with their body or the lower body or their upper body. These great players, when they get in transition, they lower themselves down and they angle themselves. Uh, it's crazy. They angle themselves back and forward. So, And you can do both. They root from the heels here, but they're angling their body to strike this way. Right, so they're they're rooting from the heels here, though. That's where the kettlebells come into play. An amateur right here, they're not rooting from the heels at all. They're all their weights on their toes are here, where his pelvis is shifted back. There's a shifted opposite where his chest is went down. Theirs is going backwards, and then they're trying to strike the ball. That's why you have opposite results. So hopefully that'll help you um, understand with when you're studying your videos what you're really trying to look for. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, I'm not against having static picture, especially in transition. Out of transition, I'm not real big into. You might study the, the shaft plane, you know, what the angles are coming in relative for you. But when you get right here, then you're starting to end in transition, going into transition, and then you're finishing transition. You, you should look at it. And if your body, you'll, you'll see that your body, and again, the average amateur will be right here. Their head will be right there backing up, and their pelvis will be forward. And they'll look at it, and they don't change anything. They just And then if they bend this much, they get bent that much like he is and, and rooted from the back. The first thing they all tell you, a high handicapper, I'm telling you, every one of them is going to tell you they're going to hit fat. And as soon as they hit it, they usually hit it better, and they will hit some fat because they're scared to death of it. Then all of a sudden they, get, they realize that in the difference between an amateur is they don't know that that's not strong. They'll see themselves look like this. But they feel their brain over here sitting here going, oh, my God, I'm, I can't. I've never done this. Well, yeah, because you're a hundred shooter. But the thing is, is you gotta, you got to commit to that. I mean, if you, you, you got to see some visual changes, I can assure you. you know, so rooting from the heels, getting the chest down in transition, those are biggies. And then slowing that club down in transition. That club needs to come to a halt so you can load up your body. You know, think of Kenny Perry. You don't need to always swing. You don't need to swing like anybody but yourself. But in general, you know, really good ones to look at, like Kenny Perry, you know, not matching up swing planes and all that stuff. But if you look at how he really just slowly wrenches himself up, Scott Piercy is one that a lot of the players on here have said, you know, 
You know, he matches up. They all do it. Tiger does it. Uh, when the Tiger played his best, McIlroy, all of them do it. Spieth. Um, so I don't really look at one, but there's some that go even on another extreme. So you can, you know, if you you almost have to, you know, you can anybody can see him. You know, uh, Matsuyama. Uh, you know, it's another one. He, you know, he'll stay there two seconds. That's just the, all he's doing that for. You're not doing a pause to just stop. What they're doing it is is to collect the club and body, get them on the same page. Uh, because when they work together through the ball, they work. Uh, that means the ball flight is better. And remember, it, it doesn't matter if you're a tour player or you're a hundred cheater. It gets better. And that's really, really, really important to remember. The depth would come second to that. But the slowing down gives you, if you just slow down and slam the club up and slam the club down and your body's standing vertical, yeah, you're not going to get a whole, you know, you, you'll get a little better, but you're not going to get much. But if you adjust in that zone where you start adjusting your body, and, you know, wrenching those hips back like I'm talking about, gradually sinking yourself and slowing down, you'll start to feel your whole body, um, you know, really connect with a lot of torque in here and load from the hips and the core um, and even up into the shaft in here. You'll start to feel it all come in like, man, uh, grip pressure can play a little part of that. So if you're in here squeezing on the club as hard as you can, well, that probably won't help you a lot. But that's in other videos, too, talking about, you know, tension versus intensity and all that. Really softening up, you, you know, being heavy um, is much more powerful and faster than being, uh, you know, stiff and rigid. So... Um, with that being said, um, we're going to, let me just pull up, see if I can find this, this swing of tire real quick, and then I'll open it up. This was a good one, uh, a kind of a new swing that kind of shows, uh, no, that wasn't it. This was it. So you can see in this new, this newer, this is a newer swing. You can see his body is moving in transition, and the club is getting narrower to his body. And if you watch here slowly, his body is outrunning forward. This is something he did not used to do. He'd actually go rotational, but he's moving outrunning it forward towards the target as this shaft is getting closer to his body. And with that being said, when he does that, you watch his right hand at the ball. So he's got narrow, and you'll see even right there, and I can tell you, uh, Tiger Woods knows that that look right there ain't good. And that right hand is crushed over that left hand, and that is not good when they're hitting the ball. Too much flip. And regardless if he had a good shot or not, I guarantee you wouldn't like that. But that's because of transition. The transition, he's running in transition towards the ball. The club's getting narrow, and it causes this right flip right there. So... Anyway, with that being said, uh, that did not happen back in the old days when Tiger dominated, I can assure you. None of that happened. It's to, that's the only difference in his swing, really. I mean, he had more patience in transition. He had a wider downswing, and he had less flip because of it. And that's why he, you know, that's why he was the man So as far as ball striking. All right, I'm going to open it up and then see if we can answer any questions. Yeah, feel free. I didn't see any chats on here, so I'm not sure if anybody sent anything or not, but I've got a lot of people on, so just feel free to, everyone wants to fire away if you have a question. Matt, this is Jim Franks. Hey, what's happening, Jim? Well, not too much. Uh, not playing too bad. You know, I'm not, uh, not shooting the scores I can shoot yet. But uh, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you sending me the videos on the cat stance. Yep. And uh, how much I just want to say how much that really, you know, taught me about getting depth and where it comes from and how it relates to me personally. And and so you know I'm I'm still working on that and I got a long way to go, but it's 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 paying off and it's getting a little better every day. So, yeah, no, that's that. Uh, the and here's the kettlebell swing. I've shown this one before too. But if you look, uh, just the exercise, and a lot of people get confused with like, um, you know, how does this really help you with golf and all that? Uh, I know that's the big question. Uh, I was with, with one of my students today, and I said he had, his wasn't specifically just that, but like, how does this really work in your golf swing? And that's a common question. It's not a bad question because you know I'll I'll do my best to explain. And my best to explain it is I've done the kettlebells. I don't miss right around 12 years or so. 
uh, with teaching it and, 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 and watching my students do it. Now, that's with me teaching them how to do the kettlebells because it's, it's an art of itself. Um, when somebody's doing the kettlebells right, they're doing the right way, not too heavy. Um, what will happen is um, they will create depth in their golf swing. They, they create this core strength in their golf swing. And if you look here, they're creating thoracic mobility. You're getting three things. So you're, you're also strengthening up the quads, which I don't talk a lot about because it's not on the number one list. But like your quads are, they hold you in front. That the frontal part of your swing, they will keep you more steady. And, and stronger quads will help you. They keep you more in alignment as your body is twisting. So, but you're getting literally everything right here. Um, and so I, I, I say it all the time, but there's a, there's a reason for it. If you look at you talk about uh, creating better posture for your golf swing. I mean, it's almost is a golf swing. I know he's been, that's the lowest part of the swing. But if you look here, really good control of the lower spine, neutral spine through the top. Got a lot of, not a lot of knee flex here. There's not a lot of flex, but there's a lot of hip hinge. That same hinge, if you look at that angle, now he's on a lower plane because he's using, uh, but if you look at that hip hinge here, that's a very steep angle. So he's having to root from the heels here. In, in kettlebells, you're taught to root from the heels. Well, you know, you've heard me talk about, everybody talks about you use the balls of feet. Well, you have to use the ball of feet for stabilizers for sure. But when you learn to get the depth, you'll learn how to, you can train yourself in like yoga and kettlebells, tai chi, how to root and move through the heels. And if you can do that, man, you got, that's in the only way you can really root through the heels is having your body angled certain ways. So you're rooting not only from the heels, you're rooting from the toes as well. Most people can figure this out. They cannot figure out how to root from the heels. And that's where the cat stance comes in. But um, creating angles. So when he does this, this is just one picture. You're, when we do a kettlebell swings in our workouts, we might do 100 of these in a row, 50 of these in a row. It's not just one static movement and you bring it back up. You're swinging your body. Your body's going, the upper body's going this way. The hips are going this way. You're creating that shearing. And then at the top, you're getting that load on the core. And uh, I, all I can tell you is, is, is through success. I've seen it happen time after time after time where I get players using kettlebells, good players, bad players, doesn't matter. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, they start to have better posture in their golf swing. They can rotate better in their golf swing. They have more speed in their golf swing. They have more torque in their golf swing. They have everything. And so... Um, and it's not just kind of like five out of 10. I mean, literally if they're doing it right, I see 10 out of 10. I see a hundred percent. If they're truly doing kettlebells, now some will get into too much weight. Some won't use enough. Most of them don't do it right. If they're not being taught, you know, studying themselves, that's the one challenging thing you have to do online is, but it's what great players did. You know, that's why they have mirrors. That's why they use video. Uh, they, you got to study yourself. The best coach you got in the world is yourself. And I'll say it till the day I die. You're going to have people that can help you. Like my job is to guide you along, but you've got to be the ones putting the time in. Now, if you're Roy McIlroy, well, yeah, go hire five people. You know, if you're Tiger Woods, go hire you a coach. Go, go hire your fitness coach, a financial coach. Go hire you all. This. But before all that, who'd they have? They just had themselves. They might have had a coach running around with them, what, one time out of the week or one time out of the two weeks? So that means the other, uh, what, 23 hours of every day between them, uh, that was them. So the best coach in the world is yourself. Now, you, my goal is to help you coach yourself, teach you how to look for things and things that people that made mistakes, myself, everybody that I've been around, pros to hundred shooters, not to fall into traps because there's a million of them out there right now. Uh, more so, there's more traps out there to playing good golf or playing bad, there's more traps into falling into playing bad golf out there right now in instruction than there ever has been in the history of the game. And... Uh, there's more confusion, and the smarter people get, the worse they get. And there's a lot of smart people that play golf because they become successful. They worked hard. They've been, they they've studied. They they've educated themselves. But this ain't about being smart. Most of the you know, be honest with you, there's there's not really that many smart ones out there except for Bryson, I guess now. But they're not. I mean, they're they're not the, they're, what they are. Is they're athletes. You know, they play golf. And they chose the right roads, and, and that's where I can help people is show them, like, you know, most people are going down the mechanical road, and you have to be aware of mechanics, and you have to respect them, and you have to change them, but you also have to play in the meantime. And so, and it, it doesn't require much more than what they're doing now, and it doesn't require a ton of work, it just requires 
spending your time in the right areas. Most people are not. I mean, I was out there the other day with a, this lady client of mine, and I sit there and I told her, I said, you know, Jason, and I, you know, she's she's really want she's going to be a good player. And I sit there and I gave this big long speech out there, probably half the lesson, yapping at her about not taking her driver and her seven iron out and trying to learn because that's what she's doing. She's dropping balls and hit. She'll hit a thousand balls a day. I'm telling you. And she's not getting. I mean, she won't get better doing that. And I've, you know, she doesn't know that. She thinks she does, she thinks she will. And I told her I went on to this conversation and said, you know, you know it's Jason Day. He spends three and a half hours a day on a short game. That's what Tiger used to do. This is what McIlroy does two and a half hours. I know because I work with his mental coach. I'm telling you, these amateurs will hit more golf balls than pros will, and they get worse. And it's and they will, but then you tell them the sand wedge and work their way up. There's people out there that they'll piddle around, and then like she was doing, she was doing a great one. I was there, and then her seven iron driver was good. I come back out three hours later, she's out there well in drivers and seven irons, you know. And, and it's just like, it doesn't, not a lick of sense, really. I mean, she knew what I knew. She would know it's the stupidest thing you could possibly do. And I'm sure there's probably a few on here that do it. But it's stupid. If you don't follow the program, I can't help you. And, you know, if you're trying to do it with your seven iron and driver, I can't help you. Because until you master that sandwich, when you master that sandwich, you're going to be high-fiving everybody because your game's going to be perfect. It's going to, the game's going to be better than it's ever been, not perfect. It'll be better than it's ever been. But if you now mastering something is a lot different than hitting 6 out of 10 or 7 out of 10 that are decent. I'm talking about hitting it like um, literally perfect relative to what you can. And when you start to do that in those 10-yard scales and, you know, 10 or 5-yard or 10-yard scale, and you start truly doing that and you're working your way up and you've got it to – 80, 90 yards with that wedge, and it's it's on and everything. Then all of a sudden, th this, you pull the seven iron out. It works this. It works the same way. The driver works the same way. The three iron works the same way. And if it doesn't, it's usually something really small and simple. It's not these big things like we were talking about earlier. Those things we we're talking about earlier are very difficult things to do. So if they're really difficult, good luck trying to do it with a seven iron. And that's what I was working with that lady on. I was working with her trying to create depth and moving lateral and getting the club to be timed up. Well, that's those are really challenging moves. But they can be done, especially if you do it really slow. You pull out a seven iron driver and you're going full mock speed. I, I don't have faith in hardly anybody getting better at doing that, to be honest with you. It's probably luck. And it's usually because they'll it, it, if a pro does it's because they're having to play more than they practice. But an amateur won't. Amateur's going to practice more typically than they play. So there's benefits to both of those. If you play more, you're going to be a better player. If you practice, you better practice. You better really guard yourself on practicing full swing all the time because I'm telling you, I don't care if you're working on the right stuff. You're not going to get better. I've done it 24 years. I've seen players come to me over and over and over and they were hitting more balls than the club champion at their club by a thousand times uh, per se and and um, they're not the players that you they're not the players that are scary the scary ones are the ones that play the most and playing little competitions and the MGA and playing money games and all those those are the ones that'll take your money and that aren't worried about you know being perfect but they've done what you don't factor in is those are the ones that spent hours around the short game they spent hours and hours and hours. They got their hands and they got their legs connected, and that's how they got good. And their swings end up being kind of however, and that's where I came up with this program. And it's probably the most important thing, lesson you can hear from me, and you can tell from the seriousness of it. Like this, this isn't a joke. Like with me, I'm, I've, see, I've seen two, be like going to a doctor that sees 2,000 patients per year, and then you got somebody, you come in there and say, I really, I think it's just, I'll just, all right, that's good. And you walk off and do what you want, and then you realize, hey, I screwed up. You know, and then you do it a hundred times in a row and you realize, wait a minute, you know, it can be easier than this. And so, and I think that's really important because I'm, uh, I'm telling you, you master your little wedge and it's, it's elementary, but that's what everybody needs on here. So if you come to me and take a lesson with me, I, there's probably players on here. I, Ricky's on here. Ricky, you on here? Hey, Ricky, you on here? He may not be. I see him on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How many times yep. do you work on? Can you hear me? Yep. How, how often do we work on a sandwich? Say that again. How often do we work on? Do, All the time. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. And this guy went from going whatever numbers, and he's dropped his hand. I mean, he's he's playing some serious golf. I mean, he's starting to hit the ball and really compete now. But I mean, his first six lessons, I never even watched him hit a seven iron. 
and I haven't watched him hit many since. He's probably taking 12, 15 lessons. I'm not sure, but I mean, it is. He will vouch for you when you come to me. If you're going to learn, learn from the shortest club in your bag, and you're going to learn how to, you're going to work with my standards. What I think you, what you're capable of being like your potential with that shot is at 20 yards or 30 and 40. And it's really important to, uh, in my opinion, to if you don't have that, I don't see how you can be any good. I mean, because seven irons not when somebody's missing a. 20 and 30 yard shot and they're halfway clipping it and it goes somewhat straight but it's bad trajectory and it doesn't have the right sound you just hit it harder it just gets worse if you're missing a 20 yard shot uh, and you're missing it five feet or 10 feet to the left a lot of people will count that shot and they don't realize the harder you hit that well that's going to end up being 50 yards left when you get to a certain level so it's really all right there in front of you and you know you should be from a 20 30 40 50 yards i'm ring really five six feet max because that's what your scratch players are doing. So that's your goal. You don't want to be. You don't want your goals to be 30 feet. You know. And I see most people judging those shots. They give themselves way too much credit. And I would not. I would be very critical. The most critical and be the most technical from the from about 20 to 40 yards. Because that's the only place where you, me, and Tiger Woods can feel anything. Outside of that, you start to. It just becomes automatic. And then it's just, is it any good or is it any good or not? So. You know, you build, there's a process we have here, and I'll give you the short version of it really quick. The short, the short version is, for your techniques, you can't, I know you can't feel anything more than from uh, when you swing a 7-iron at full mock speed or driver, because I can't. I, you can feel the after effects, but you can't fix it. I know that because I can't, and I've been doing it my whole life. So, what I do know is if you take a sand wedge, you can be very, very, very technical and be very, very, very efficient and make some radical changes in your swing and then also build your short game and, and, and that, will, that will transfer so you get two for one. You get, you get a better short game and you get a much better long game. Now, the second stage of this, and there's more, but I just if you had two things, you give me two things. That's one right there because that's how I'm going to build your swing with a sand wedge. The second part is I'm going to grab a kettlebell and we're going to do some yoga and tai chi and we're going to get your body to function. You don't have to do it very often, but if you only said, okay, you don't get the other two, tai chi or, or yoga, you, I give you the kettlebell. And the kettlebell will start to make that long swinger. It'll open up the spine. Why it does it, I'm not 100% sure. And anybody that says they know, it's probably one. But I just know it does. It opens up the thoracic. It opens up the hips. It opens up the mobility. It gives you a wider arc. And it gives you more flow in your swing. And anybody that's not doing this, been on this program, is, is my opinion, if you're spending the money you're spending on here, you're crazy not to do it. Crazy. So that's how important that is. I mean, it's right there in front of you. You're paying for a full swing, but the, I'm telling you, when people say they go work on their swing, look, when you go hit a, two bags of range balls, I don't consider that work, or five, ball, five bags or a thousand. I don't consider that work. That's work in your mind, maybe. Because it's not a real hard game. Now, if you were doing wind sprints, I'd call it work. You know, if you're doing bench press, I'd call it work. But you're doing hitting golf balls, that's not work. But what it does is those get you in trouble. Go out and take that kettlebell out. And next time you want to you want to go out and hit for an hour, take your kettlebell out and work for 25, 30 minutes and see which one feels the worst as far as work. The kettlebell is going to help you get further along than hitting two bags of balls, three bags of balls, or whatever it may be. And I'm just doing It's just like, this is what I do. I do it every day. And I have for 24 years. This has been my life. And I'm telling you that I have seen it over and over and over with clients. You fix your wedge, you get better. You fix your body, you get better. And now you start to marry together. And then you have your bond that comes in. You're obviously going to be confident. Once you do those two things, they get better. Well, your confidence is going to go up even without even working on the middle game. But those are two majors that we do with every player, whether you're Tiger Woods or you're, you know, Mrs. Smith at 60, we're going to tell you to do both of those. So I know I went off there, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep it going. Uh, any other questions? So I have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I do. I can hear you. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm doing the kettlebells with, with 20 pounds, right? Yep. 20 pounds seems to be extremely light for me. <laughs> so when do I know to go to a heavier weight, right? Or is 20 where you want me to stop and just extend it longer? That way the stamina goes longer? Or do you just, or can I up it to 30 if it starts getting too light for me? 
Well, it's a good question because, you know, you, you, it sounds like you listened to our last webinar with Chris on here uh, where I was talking about the 20-pound kettlebell. Um, the the 20-pound kettlebell is for joint fu uh, function and health. And so it's a good question because you don't have to do 20 pounds every day. I would just do 20 pounds, especially if you're really strong. I would do 20 pounds on the days you play. Now, 20 pounds for most men is the first, especially the first few times they do them, it's going to wear them out. Now, there's some men on here that have been training or just naturally strong, played football, I got, and it's just a piece of cake. But really, it helps both, it helps them, everybody really, because the ones that aren't strong, it develops strength. The ones that are strong, it develops mobility. And that's just from years of experience of working with it. Now, I would tell you that if you wanted a heavier day, you wanted a little more work, um, but again, it kind of goes into kettlebells, like can you do a goblet squat? Can you do a full squat without letting your thoracic bend forward or do an overhead squat? Or can you do a, a massage press, you know, like Chris, Chris, I showed uh, Chris maybe on here tonight. He was the one that held the webinar. We did the webinar with guest speaker and I'm um, working with him on his long drive. And he's just, you know, he's a, he's an ox, man. He is strong as a bull. He can do whatever he wants weight wise. And I kept telling him, I was like, in the first day, I, I gave him a workout to do. It's on our website. I said, follow it and do it with a 20 pounder. He thought I was crazy. He does it. And the next day he's blowing me up, texting me about how good he felt, how good he hit the ball and all this, because it, it, there's a, it's a magic number for some reason. Um, now, if, if you do 30, 45 pounds, those are going to wear you out. Now, 45 pound kettlebell, especially if you're doing doubles, because you have single and doubles with kettlebell. One, on, like she's holding. If you look here, she's got a two hand swing. Well, in traditional kettlebells, you they don't even like that. Like the, the Russian uh, kettlebell specialist, they they want you to do you know uh, have a you know you would train with a single first on one arm, and you're doing one arm swings, and then you would have you know as you get better. After a few weeks, you go to double. So you might have 20 on one arm, 20 on the other arm. So that might be another option for you is doing, you know, one arm swings, but doing them with uh, 20 on one and 20 on the other. Then when you do your squats, uh, your your um, uh, your swings and your presses and all that, it just it keeps you a little more engaged. But it's really not about if you're really strong, uh, which sounds like you are, Um it's really not about trying to make you stronger. It's really trying to make you more mobile and more um, joint, have better jo joint connection and joint uh, function. So connection would be like, so um, I try to put, let me put some images to the, what I'm saying here. Uh, even with him, I mean, it's like I was halfway criticizing him earlier, but I mean, he's still better than 99.9%, .9%, if not better than all of them when he's healthy. But like, so from here, if you look at his, his joint function is just like perfect. I mean, it's conne the connection. The connection of it's perfect. He outruns it a little bit in transition, but his body and his club, they're all working together. So really good um, connection. Joint function is like how deep he can get into his hips, if that makes sense. Um, so how deep can you get in? Well, he's pretty deep. How much can you rotate it? Pretty deep. Um, how much can you tilt and maintain good thoracic mobility? Obviously, him. How much arc can you keep through the lat? That's your lat muscles that control that. Also, your tricep uh, uh, controls some of that. Uh, yeah. Some obviously some of the traps and the delts. That's joint function, and that's what uh, the kettlebells will help do. Is they'll help lengthen the muscles with that weight. If you're not strong yet, and it, you know, there's been people that are really strong on here, and then they grab a 20 pound kettlebell and it just wears them out. Um, especially if you do, I think it's video number 20 on our workout session. That's the one video, that's the video that turned me uh, really 100% into kettlebells. I'd done them before that, but when I got that video, I immediately um, uh, just, it was like striking gold. And then when I, when I show people that, now that's a tough video, Chris was like, oh man, this is where you out, you know, because it's eight, it, well actually it's 10 rounds, it goes on for about an hour, but you can do one round, two rounds, four rounds. You can do eight rounds if you want. They're five-minute rounds, but then there's in-between sets with, with uh, abs and core work and stuff like that. But I'm telling you, I, if you just swing a kettlebell and you don't put anything behind it, yeah, it, it'll, it'll get you warmed up and all that. But when you start doing the core work and some yoga and mixing up with some yoga and some, some other things and get the body hot and then loose, um, I don't know, it just has a special effect where it just starts to – it doesn't matter what player it is. It just they hit it better, uh, and 
Um, and, you know, we, we back at our old shop, we used to have the um, at the uh, we used to have the uh, launch monitor always out. And we would show them, we'd test them before and after. And I've got data when players would come in doing CrossFit. I had one that was a CrossFit owner, and he'd come in and and I'd say, "Look, man, you're wearing. I mean, what'd you do? Dips and push-ups all day or what?" And you could see his numbers would drop, and, it, and he was a good player. And then when I would come in, I'd bring a kettlebell and I would just work him out for 20 minutes to try to break some of that up and get the muscles to rebound. You could see the numbers would start changing and I would not even give him uh, a tip. You know, we would just be getting, because that was the tip. I mean, that was showing him, you know, like that's a part of, of uh, you know, when you're already a plus three handicap, this guy was a plus three handicap, you know, I think three or four time club champion, uh, but he's doing CrossFit and he's all of a sudden he's struggling. Well, you know, he's not struggling. The only thing that changed in his, his life with his golf was he did CrossFit. And I'm not here to rip. I'm not trying to rip CrossFit. I'm just saying that the weights were too heavy. The workouts were too intense. And he couldn't. It was tightening him. He was making too much connection here and not enough flow. So that's the difference between connection and flow. And, long, you know, you know, function is how the joints can, the arc of it, how deep you can get. And those things, that's function. And then connection is like if you can take that big arc and those long muscles and make connection out of it. That's like the perfect world. You know, it is like the Tiger Woods or McElroy's or, uh, you know, Spieth even or whatever it would be, Dustin Johnson's. But everybody has that in them, and that's the thing is what's it's bad is like we, we can all – we it's when I show these players, well, I, I'm not going to show a 20 handicapper up here. I mean, there's no reason to. But what I will do is show you everybody tell you is everybody's going to have their own swing, and but they can always get better in their functional fitness for golf. And improve themselves just I mean you can there's two ways you can improve yourself right off the bat with our program the first one is grab your sandwich out and, and just start working from the, the base up and, and I get emails every week proving that the second part is grab a kettlebell and start messing around with it and start doing your workouts and that's that's the fastest way to get on track after that there's other things too but Everybody wants the fast track, and that, I'm just giving I'm giving it to you. If you're on our webinar program, you're not doing it. You're missing out. You're hurting yourself on that because it's just I mean you don't feel everybody that does the kettlebells not just grabs one and swings it around um, for five minutes, ten minutes, or whatever, and messes around incorrectly. You start if you grab it and you really pay attention to it and get used to it. Do the workouts. Some of them that are online, uh, it'll wear you out one, but then all of a sudden you just come out and you'll you'll hit it really good. But on weight training, going back to the question is um, how much weight you can. I would tell you if you if you're a weekend golfer that yeah, if you're going to hit heavy weights, do them on Monday. You know, do them on Sunday or Monday, and then then as you're going into the playing part of the week, so you might say if 20 is too easy for you, then go to 40. But um, but also make sure that you're not doing in. Uh, movements that are incorrect because i've seen players that can muscle i mean there's human beings i mean there's some that are just super freaky strong and they can muscle a kettlebell around like crazy but their function's terrible you know they don't have the range or they're giving up their knees for a squat they're giving up their thoracic and that's not function which is a big part of what makes you better in your golf fitness so i would tell you if you're looking at yourself and you're able to do all the functional movements and you need to go heavier just for, you know, daily living or whatever, I would tell you to do that on, like, Mondays. Um, and then I would uh, I would give yourself a break. And if you weren't playing until Saturday, you could do it on Wednesday. But, you know, if you watch the tour and uh, um, the tour players, when you go into the, the, to the fitness trailer, and I've been in there a lot of times, and when you go in there, um, they're not in there throwing around, even these big studs, they're not throwing around 75, 80-pound weights and 40 and 50s. They're, they're doing, you know, 20, 30s. Uh, really light weights, and they're not doing it for very long, and they're all doing a lot of TRX. They're doing a lot of mobility. They're doing a lot of stretching. Uh, some of them will get the cardio up on the machines early on the bikes, and then they're doing, I, you know, literally, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I try to do it as close to to teach it as what they're, what's going on out there right now, and where I also think the future's at. I don't just stop there. I always think where, what's, what's going to be the next 15 to 20 years, and uh, that's really important. And you don't have to be a when we, as golfers are the worst, you know, we're the worst ones, you know, I remember, I remember I used to not work out, I hated it, and, but uh, then you do it one time, you get the right workout, and you won't hate it as much, because it affects your golf, and then it's exciting, you get to get your health better, and you get your golfing better, so, 
but as a whole, you know, most people, golfers have, they've had workouts and they come back and they're too, they come back and they're extremely tight. They didn't have any success for a month on their fit or on their uh, golf course. So they quit doing it. And so, you know, that's why it's so important to, uh, I think what, what we've tried to do on the site is to show you that it's not about strength and all the tightening your muscles up. It's about loosening them up, even yoga. You, know, you go to a lot of yoga classes, and you go to a straight vinyasa class, you know, where you go in there and they bust you up, they, you won't be flexible. You won't feel loose. You might feel loose that night. You'll wake up the next morning and barely move. So there's very few things you can do where you actually break up the fascia and you can really move and, and openly move. Um, after a workout, like, say, two, three hours, even if you've been sitting and so forth, and that kettlebell is one of those that does it. It's not the only workout, and I'll never say that. It's not your beach body workout. It's not going to do all that. Um, but it, it, for good health and joint function, I have yet to see anything that supersedes that. So... Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I hope it helps you. I mean, just let me know. I mean, I, I'm sure you'll find a difference. Just uh, that I know that I know you can. Sounds like you can do a lot more weight than 20 pounds. But in in for your general health, you can probably do whatever whatever you're comfortable. But uh, you know, I would study your videos and tell you look at that 20. But make sure that you're doing them, the exercises exactly like it says to do them, like on the injury prevention page. And then the first 20, I would say the first I think 19 or 18. Uh, videos on the workout page is like how to do the lifts properly, which, you know, um, it doesn't have to be perfect, but there is a perfect to it. There really is. Um, there's a way to do it for everybody that's, that's exact. You just kind of have to find that. Do you have any other questions? I'm sure we do. A lot of people on here tonight, so... I'll keep it open for a little bit. I'm sure somebody's got something. Hey, Matt, just to touch back on, uh, my phone was breaking up a little bit when you were talking. Yeah. But uh, just to kind of dive into it a little bit, I've only, I've only, I think we've touched my driver once, and that was because I asked you to look at five balls. Yeah. Other than that, and I probably, what, maybe my seven iron once, and that was only by your choice. Other than that, we really haven't even touched into it, but everything else has improved. Only working on my 56 and 60 with you. Like, you really haven't seen any other club in my bag. I honestly, sometimes I'm curious on why I even bring my bag because there's really no point. I mean, I get everything I need to out of my 56. Yeah, that's uh, that's Ricky. He lives here in Austin, and you come out. It's about bi-weekly, wouldn't you say? Something like that. Sometimes we go a little longer than that, but most of the time bi-weekly for our lessons. And um, so, you know, Ricky came to me just like you know most people, but you know, Ricky's got some talent, but he just didn't, you know, he it wasn't, you know, wasn't showing. You know, I think what were you shooting, Ricky? Uh, you know, the you were shooting some pretty high scores before. Right? Where you're in the nineties and and above, sometimes, right? Yes, sir. Easily 90s and above. Um, and then putting was huge <laughs> when you took away my putting. That, that helped out a lot. Yeah, our story with, with Ricky, and I, 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 I'm, we're going to start documenting a little bit better. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I've got too many irons in the fire right now to do that. When, with the, but I do have some before stuff with Ricky when he first started. And he's actually on our website. He's on uh, like the 10-yard scale. And uh, I can't remember which number. It's it's on the first stage, but you'll see him like that's where he's at. And you know he was struggling like crazy that day, and he struggled like crazy for several lessons. But that was like literally trying to hit it ten to twenty yards, and that's my whole point. You know, um, it takes a lot of discipline to math to try to master the wedge, but every great player did it. Like you're never going to see a great player on the way on the tour that like there's some that are better than others, but like there's not anybody that like miss blading them and hitting them fat and you know 
you know, they wouldn't be on the tour. It's impossible. I mean, they but they mastered that that club and their putter was the first two that they mastered. And it, it, and Ricky's heard this song and dance for me. And I wear people out sometimes just talking to them because it's not always about the techniques. It's a, it's a lot of times it's about knowing if you just hear it enough or the right time you catch it. Um, it just it clicks for you, and I, I say this all the time uh, to players, especially the guys that are older than I am. I and mean, if you're in their 50s and 60s, because they they expect it to be treated treated different. They they think that they're smarter, and it's a lot of ways they are, and a lot of ways they're dumber. And what I'll say the dumb parts are, is like they'll see a they'll see a they'll go, hey, I can't hit my seven iron, I can't hit my driver, just like same song and dance, and they can't. No, they're right. And I'll say, all right, hit it 20, 30 yards, and I'll give me a sandwich 20 30 yards and they're they're wiping it and slapping it same exact move just a smaller version where you can actually feel it and change it and they'll they'll uh, they'll start coming in there and they'll go well, you know I, that's not what I'm I don't want to work on that part and I said well, let me say let me ask you something if you had a son or grandson here and they had a little bit of talent a little bit not a lot if they had a lot you wouldn't have to be struggling so if you had a little bit of talent which you do would you want them to start with something they can't do, or would you want them to start with something they can do and learn? And so, you know, Harvey Pennant, one of the greatest coaches of all time, always started the green back. He always started with a putter to the wedge, a chipping and to pitching, and you worked into wedge play. And, you know, this you look at Harvey, some, you ought to go on and Google his his resume, Harvey Pennant. And he gets lot, laughed at by a lot of people in the golf business that the, the – uh, the uh, the teachers because of the fact they always said well he's too he was too he wasn't technically he didn't know how to fix this he didn't know how to fix that look at, his rest. Look at the players that he worked with and tell me that that guy didn't know what he was doing it's impossible and, and, and he, it didn't matter he always started him around the green he wanted to see him he would um, even Wes uh, short you know went to Harvey back in the day and 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 he said hey you know watch Harvey watched him four or five balls or whatever with his irons and he said. Well, then you go look at your putting. And, uh, you know, Wes was like, well, I'm not, that's not really one, you know, I just wanted you to look at my swing, you know, because he was known for that. But Harvey knew, like, no, we need to look at your putting. Well, one of the things that, that hurt Wes in his career was his putting. And it didn't kill him, but he wasn't, he was always streaky. But that's my point is, like, you know, he just had an eye for what the coaching aspects of it were. And so when you, when you, when I, I'll tell somebody this every time when they come out, if you had a son or a daughter or whatever, grandson, a granddaughter, and you brought them to me and you said they got some some talent, not a lot, they got some, they're gonna they have a chance to be good. We want them to be good. You're not gonna want me out there having bashing drivers with them the whole time. You're gonna want to bring them back and work them the way out. No, why would you want to do that? Why would you not want to do that if you're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old? You can't cheat the system. If it's better to do it one way, why do we do it a different way? Why do we teach adults with a seven iron and driver full mock speed, but yet we teach juniors that have talent that actually actually have talent with a wedge? It makes no sense at all to me, and it never will, and it won't ever be taught with what we do either. So what my job is is to educate people that you can't outsmart the game. You have to just start elementary and work your way up. And if you struggle, at 20, if you've got the 20-yard shot and you've mastered it, that's great. Can you do it 30 or 40? If you got that, that's great. If you got it 50, 60, that's great. If you got it 70 or 80 and you got it mastered, I haven't seen anybody struggle with their full swing that did that. I mean, it's, I've never had anybody break that theory. Now, I've had people that think that, they're, that they've got it, but I, I'm telling you, I've never, you know, when I watch them, I'm going, no, that's, that sounds wrong. The sliding off the face, you know, you're inconsistent. You're hitting 7 out of 10 versus, you know, 9 out of 10. But you take anybody off of any tour, LPGA, PGA, champions or whatever, and you let them hit balls from 10 yards to 100, and you'll see what they're capable of. They don't miss. That from, from 10 to 50, from 10 yards, you're probably chipping most of them in. From 50, um, you know, or not 10 yards, chipping them all in, but they're chipping them within a foot circle. At, at 50 yards, they're within 5 feet. And if it's just a flat lie on the range, they're going to be 5 feet max. And so, and, but then they can hit the 7 iron, they can hit the driver, they can hit the 3 with 7 iron. So what happens is these we as adults, we look at that and we go, we can do that too if I just had the right swing tip or the right, if I just had the right idea or the right, you know, swing thought or swing plane or whoever it is or impact, I could do that. Well, no, you can't. How do you, if you can't do it at 
20, 40, 50 yards, and I can guarantee when you put bigger swing to it and more effort into it, you're not going to magically all of a sudden be, uh, you know, you know, hitting your seven iron and driver and three wood. Now, if you get those grooved in and, and there is a problem, be the first time I've ever seen it, then I would, that's where I would say, well, let's, hey, man, let's just take a look at it or, or whoever it is. And we'll take a look at it and go from there. But I, I'm just telling you, I mean, you you fix that 10-yard scale, 5-yard scale, you're going to be in good shape. But it just gets overlooked. People give themselves too much credit in that territory. They think that because it's not a they, – they look at it when they miss it. Is when they miss it, they think that they're hitting it okay because it might run up 6, 7 feet or it's off. And it doesn't – but they, if they listen to the sound, the clackiness of it, if they listen to the, you know, the sole of the club where it's really striking – and if they look, watch the ball flight when it hits the green, if it's really spinning to the right for a right-handed golfer, what do you think it's going to happen if you hit it really hard? It's going to spin even more. Um, watch the trajectory. If it's sliding up the face and really high, um, there's just things you have to really take note of, those those four things we talk about, which is basically it's the it's the contact is number one. This You don't hit the contact. Nothing else matters. So you have to have contact is number one. Then number two is the initial start line, trajectory is number three, and then ball control, which is, means uh, the ball rotation left or right or right to left and the distance that it ends up. That's the same as it is with an iron or a driver or whatever. You want those four things always in place, and so the place to do it is with that old sand wedge and just wear it out. Just like the, every great player played on the tour, um, and that's who you want to think about, uh, not for their bodies and how athletic they are. There's, there's plenty of guys out there that weren't athletic. You just think that they they mastered those scoring clubs first, and uh, the scoring clubs in order are would be well it's di- it can be different when you get to the depends on the player, but I can tell you how you train it better be with that same wedge and putter. When you get in reality, when you start playing, it better be the driver, it better be the driver and and then the putter and then the then the wedges. But but you don't train with that driver first. I can assure you that. Good luck if you do. You know it just won't be there. And it sounds bad. I know it make it sound kind of harsh and, and whatever rough, but I just I do it every day. This is what I do. And if you follow this step, you'll get better. Um, you'll, you'll, this process, you'll, you'll get better. There's no doubt about it. But you just have to be really critical and study your videos inside these, inside these 20, even 20, 30, 40 yard shots. You just have to really kind of take your time and, and cause nobody can, once you, once you learn what you need to start doing, um, then you can study yourself and you can say, all right, well, I, yeah, I didn't look right. I, if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't. And I don't mean swing plan or anything like that, but if you see your body, you'll start to see some weird stuff pop up and you go, I probably need to deal with that. And then you seem to start seeing these little visual changes and then from there, you, and you can do that with these little wet shots and then you start to convert it with the big clubs. The conversion of the big clubs is not difficult. It's the short clubs. You know, more people have... They, they, they hate some of the stuff we do because it exposes them so much. You know, seven iron, you hit a half, half you know, half clack it or whatever, and you roll it up the green, you know, or you skank it off 30 yards to the right. But on a 20, 30, 40-yard shot, a lot of people, they have duff it right in front of them. They skull it over the green. They hit it way right, way left, and it drives them crazy. And that's the whole point because you can skank a seven iron, and you might, you know, run it up. The, you might make a hole in one top it, you know. But you, you top one behind a bunker over there, you know, with a short side of flag and see what happens. Or or you skull one when you got a palm behind the green from 30 yards and see what happens. That's your your most touch and finesse and control. So um we got any other questions? Yeah, and they, they haven't added the uh, – the, there's three videos that they're just basic elementary workout videos for the uh, for the kettlebells. I've sent them out in the webinars in the past, but I'll send them uh, – I'll make sure those get posted this week so that they're on the, the site too. But there's number 20, I believe, the number 20 and 21. 20 is the number one. That's like the, that's like the workout that really turned me 100% into the bells just because of what it does consistently uh, with my players and myself included and – I just, it's very, very, very consistent with what the results it puts out. It's a very difficult workout. I wouldn't tell you if you're a novice to try to pull it off, but I would tell everybody to try it and just play around with it, whatever level you're at. But make sure that, Matt, is that the, yeah, go ahead. Is that the 
40 minute kettlebell workout. Yeah, is that the 40 minute kettlebell workout? I was just looking over there. There's one on there. So it's the Art of Strength in Newport. And one of our students, Matt Willens, I don't know if he's on here tonight or not, but uh, he sent it to me. That's uh, it used to be just a, you had to, it was about a forty dollar DVD, and now we got a link for it that um, uh, it's for uh, Art of Strength yeah. Newport Newport work. Yeah, I got it. I see. Yeah, it, that's the one you want. I'm not on the site right now, and uh, I have that's to. It. Uh, it's, uh, you're right. It's about twenty down in the functional golf workout. Yeah, that should be it. And it's got Anthony on there, and it's uh, like I said, uh, Anthony's been to Austin several times. Phenomenal with what he does, and um, it's just a hundred percent functional. I mean, it just, it just, it covers, it covers everything. And, uh, you, but it's good to study it even because I remember when I first started the workouts and all that, you know, it, without studying it yourself, the videos, you're making all kinds of, you know, crazy movements. I mean, even people that have trained in it for a while, but, um, you know, it's good to study it though. I mean, just to look at joint alignment, look at your knee alignment, uh, relative to your hip and your feet. Look at uh, is your you know is your is your knee getting past the ball of your foot on any of the movements? Look if your thoracic spine on a goblet squat is dropping down or or pushing forward. Um, are you rooting from the heels? Are you pulling? You know, there's a lot of techniques, man. I mean, uh, it just there, there's a lot of techniques, and if you start to do them right, your body just starts to function right. You know, it it just you may look the same. I'm not saying you're gonna be, you're not gonna come in here and you know. Uh, be ripped up or anything else but if anybody asks you can you do a full squat yep no problem overhead this how what's your lap flexibility perfect you know what's your you know whatever test you want to try somebody tries to do to test your joint function if you're doing this a lot you i can't say you'll pass it all the way that's crazy but like you will be a lot better than what you would have been before um and there's a lot of tests that you, you know if you go to a physical therapist or sports conditioning specialist that they'll run you through and um uh, this without even testing them is just going to help you. That's why that's why I like it so much. You don't have to go in and do a thirty point thirty two point checklist and find out where you're weak at. You can just start doing it, and you'll start to get really really good um, at just functional movements for yourself. And that's that, that's why I believe it. And it, I guess the main reason I have I probably sitting here BSing a little bit. Main reason why I like it is because the first time I did it, I went out and played you know some of the best golf of my life, and I kept doing it, and I kept doing it, I kept doing it. And I kept thinking, huh, if I'm doing that, I wonder what other players would do. And that's how it spread. You know, I just, that workout is the one that is, it, that is the workout that really, really turned me on to, um, and, it, and, it, and it helped me in so many ways, golf being the number one. And if that wouldn't have been for golf, I hate to say it, I probably wouldn't have done it very much. But I've done that workout 10,000 times. I mean, literally. Um, because I love it, love the way it makes me feel. If I don't play golf, I'm, I feel I don't know what the kettlebells do, why it works like that, how it hits the brain. But they used there's a the joke inside the kettlebell world. They always put these smiley faces on the kettlebell because when you're when you're done doing the kettlebell workouts, you always feel like smiling and you're pretty happy. Um, not all workouts are like that, you know. They're not. I mean, some people say you know your endorphins go up, and but I've had workouts where I don't feel that great, and, and I, you know I feel like I'm exhausted and this. But the kettlebells I always feel like I have a lot of energy. It's really clean energy. It lasts throughout the day. My brain's really clear. Uh, I don't know. I, I could just go on and on and on about that workout. And uh, now it's free. It used to be. Yeah, I, if, go ahead. No, I was just going to jump in there and, and and maybe back that up a little bit. Um, I coach some. I coach high school football too, and and I'm not the strength coach, but I do some work around that and all that. And the big difference is that. Uh, the kettlebell is so dynamic, and everything you were just saying about in, involving the joints and, and the fascia, the fascia rather, mm -hmm. uh, everything has to work as an integrated whole. And just that, um, what a lot of people miss is with anything you're doing with the weights, it's not even as much about, you think it's about training your muscles and making your muscles stronger, it's as much or more about training your central nervous system to deal with it. So if, if you never lifted weights and you go into the gym, you learn how to do it right. And let's just say we're talking about uh, barbells and dumbbells. All right. You'll get amazingly stronger in six weeks, but that's not because your muscles got stronger. They will a little bit, but that's because your central nervous system got better. So if you take the kettlebell into it and the dynamic movement of that, it's as much training of the central nervous system 
and how all of that needs to fire and work together as it is anything about strength. Uh, that's cool. I'm glad you jumped in there. And uh, no, that's right. I mean, you, you're seeing like, I, I think I said that earlier too, a little bit about like, uh, you, you know, high school football and now high school football is like college football was, you know, 20. I mean, it's competitive. I mean, it's crazy. But what stuff that they're doing now that when I was around, you know, you, you, got, you should throw bench press up and that was, you know, a few power cleans and you thought you were doing something. But now it's not, now the, the strength and conditioning programs are in the high schools and some of these high schools in particular. And um, kettlebells always going, to, if you take an Olympic athlete, I would say, I shouldn't say every sport because I don't know, I don't, but I would say just about every single sport in the Olympics, you're going to have the athletes within those sports, just about every one of them that is done. And if they're not, they're missing out. And it doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. Uh, I'll never say that. There, there's, I, I believe somebody will have something better than, than this eventually. I just hadn't seen it yet. Until I see it, I don't know what that is. So, and, and, but... I can tell you, and I've heard this from coaches and, and particular strength coaches, is that, uh, you know, with the kettlebells, they, they've had players in there, you know, you know, whether it's football or whatever, and they're pushing up the bench press and they're putting up these serious numbers. And then all of a sudden they take, you know, kettlebells, or kettlebells and medicine balls and they have them not train for like a week or two. Their muscles are recovering and they're just having them do all these functional movements. They come back in and start lifting and all of a sudden they break these plateaus, you know, they start doing these new personal records is what they call them. And, um, no, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. And, and it's a little bit of a benefit of just doing some things differently. But, it, but again, back to the thing with the kettlebells about the dynamic nature of them, the central nervous system training and the fact that it's the muscles, it's the joints, it's the fascia, it's everything. Yeah, that and like you said, with the central nervous system, we're still learning about that. We still don't under nobody understands it completely, other than the fact that if you make it better than what you were, you're going to do better in whatever you're doing. Um, but that there's just no doubt about it, and so that's the reason why. And it's new to a lot of us golfers, you know. And the first time I did this, I thought, my lord, where where's this been my whole life? You know, the first I mean, I remember the first workout that I did with it. Um, I thought I could tell I was going to hit it good. And I did. And I thought, if I can, well, yeah, I mean, if that's the case, well, how good can we get with this? And, and it changed. I mean, kettlebells were a big part of where we, ch it helped change kind of what we do. And we were the only game in town for a long time that was really teaching it to golfers, you know, because golfers were scared of weights and they still are in a lot of ways. But, you know, TRX was popular, but TRX doesn't do half the stuff that a kettlebell do, in my opinion, with, with what you're really going for. Now we use TRX too, you know, but even yoga. Uh, I've seen golfers do yoga, some serious yoga workouts, and not get a lot out of it. Um, where yoga is really good is, you know, what we found was with, with balance, but it'll wear you out too. I mean, you do an hour and a half yoga session, hot yoga, and uh, you, you, you're going to be, you know, it'll open you up. It does similar things, but it's not like just the kettlebell. The kettlebell just has been amazing for, for, for golf, and that's about all I can speak for. But I've heard it from every sport, like Michael was talking and, uh, you know, and Coach was talking there. If you're a coach in any sport, you if you haven't seen kettlebells and you haven't done it, um, the first time you get it, you're kind of going to start going, huh, this is interesting. You know, we're going lighter and getting more weight or we're getting faster velocities, you know, like at a rotational sport. If you're a quarterback or, a, you know, a golfer or whatever it may be, a hammer throw, you just get more. It has to do with coordination. It gets that connection, and it does it where it doesn't make your muscles so bulky that you can't move. And, you know, some sports you got to have that. If you're a lineman, you're, you're an offensive, defensive lineman, you better be able to move some weight in front of you. But in golf, you don't do that. You're twisting. It's like a field goal kicker or a quarterback. You know, you're it's twisting and throwing. You're not having to muscle somebody around, you know. So, but I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you, you, you chimed in there because, um, you know, a lot of times I'm sitting on the – fence by myself on this one with, with the kettlebells in the golf world, but you, the great players, if you study them, even look at some of the workouts, like TaylorMade had a workout the other day, and, you know, I think it was Sergio doing the squat squats back there and all that, and you see all these bar, or these dumb, or uh, not dumbbells, but kettlebells in the back, these these little kettlebells in the back, and if you look for them, you'll see them now on these commercials with these golfers even now, and they're, they're doing them, 
Uh, it's all I can say. And if they're not, it does. They could be winning every week. And in my opinion, if they're not doing, even if they were winning every week, they would be better if they did do them. So that's sometimes the downsides is sometimes we don't see what they could be doing. And um, and I'm sure there's things out there. Uh, there I know there's things out there right now that I don't know about that could make you you know better. But I've trained with a lot of the best, and and I have not ever heard anybody say anything negative about the kettlebells. And it's all it's just you know the best ones in the world to tell you that they that they have to have it in their toolbox. They have to have a 20 30 pound kettlebell in their toolbox to, for joint function and health. And that's what this is for. It's all about. So. Um, if we have any other questions, we'll fire away. Yeah, Matt, when we were working together earlier today, you, you mentioned uh, a drill or an exercise you thought would be helpful that you said you decided to go public with. I don't know if you posted that, and I can't remember what it was about. Yeah, it's on the YouTube. Uh, I can send it to everybody on here, but it's on the it's on our YouTube page. It's a public video. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Oh, I'm just gonna mute it for a little bit. Um so yeah, there was a there was a video that I was, you know, I debated to go whether I was gonna go make it on our private side or our, our public side. And I had made a public video in a long time and I thought, well, I'll throw it out there and it, it, it took off and it's the last it's the very first one if you go to our our YouTube page and um, and if you're subscribed on and I'm not sure everybody subscribed on there but it was the uh, automatic hand slash uh, body drill and um, you know that one has really taken off uh, not only from a, I think it's almost uh, got a, you know 1200 1300 hits in three days and so that tells me people it was it, it spoke to people one because I hadn't given one out in a while but I've put out videos where they'll get you know 300 in a, a month you know this one is just going like crazy and there's nothing special about it. All I'm doing is hitting a chip shot. I mean, it's really actually, I was pretty freaking shocked, but I was wanting it on our private site because it is, I'm not, I wasn't trying to put anything, and there's nothing special about really anything we do. I just think it's a lot more in order with what we're doing on the structured side. And I don't, I don't want to give, I don't ever want to cross that bridge where I start doing one for the other, not the other, you know, but this was one that I really, if you, if you need to know what we do, it's there. This is what we do. And it ain't, and it's the first step. I'm not going to put stage two, three, four, and five because that's not fair to people who are studying. But this is, this is a good basics. But then there's still a lot of stuff that was wasn't put in there. Um, I could have made that video for four hours and let it run because uh, to cover all the traps and pitfalls that people fall into just coming outside of you know literally a 15, 20 yard shot. And and if you don't, and, and if you do that. Um, you know, if you have that, even if you, you know, takeaway doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, Raymond Floyd, Nancy, well, I show videos all the time. Takeaway doesn't have to be perfect. But when you're building your swing, like I was saying earlier, you got, I have to factor in the amateurs don't, they don't compensate in a good way and they don't adjust at all in a good way. So you, you, you don't have to make them perfect, but you better keep them in a pretty gray area because, and it's not a bad way to do it because the fact you're not going to adjust, if you're not going to compensate, then that means that, you know, the club's going to be slamming down from either a straight angle or a bent angle, and a bent angle is not good, you know, for golf. Bent line is not good. And so what I try to do is just show you what's most optimal. And and then we'll probably eventually within the site show recovery. Like if you can't, like, because everybody can't, you don't, you don't have to. It's just like if you don't know. But the, the problem is it's showing, like, how people, how to recover and, um, you know, and, that one they don't recover and they don't understand why they need to recover that's probably the biggest challenge with that but we will eventually have things on here and like if you are inside you know you you roll the club down and in on the backswing or up and out on the backswing um here's what you have to do we have things within that like your first five videos I, there's there's several of them that talk about how to recover but more in detail and more in depth and more in why because there you can do you you don't there's so many swings that will work. It's just that uh, um, if something's not changing, with especially with the shaft, the shaft has to change. You know, it has to recover. The body, you can do things without the body with full support of the body, but you, you ought to have the shaft and the, the, the sole of the club right. That's for sure. Um, so, 
But the body does give support, and if somebody's hips are pushed forward, like we talked about tonight, and the club slams down out of transition, I can guarantee you 99 out of 100, if it's not 100 out of 100, that they're, they're not going to have support. And when I say support, like um, st good striking angles through the ball. It just it won't happen. You, your platform, I mean, if your platform's broken, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to build a roof on it if your base is broke, you know? So, and that's what most of us are dealing with, you know, we're dealing with, that broken base and you want to go in and get that base and it starts in transition and it also starts with the other stuff we talked about tonight the kettlebell i'm telling you kettlebells help all that doesn't fix all of it not going to but it, i'm telling you it does it, i've seen it perform miracles for players especially decent players Do we have any other questions? Hmm. Yeah, if, if any of you want to send your swings in, uh, I know we have some on here that, that do that. Um, you can send your swings in and bring it up on a webinar. We can certainly do that. And then uh, we can one track the process. We, we're starting a... Uh, uh, see, Larry Dagenhart, um, some of you may have heard of his story, and if you haven't, um, you'll be hearing about it pretty soon because we're going to start a, a YouTube series for him. Larry played on the uh, PGA Tour back in 78 and 79, and um, uh, he played he, he played in a, a one Champions Tour event. That's really uh, how we got going was – it was where was it at the Kinko? Uh, I can't remember which which event it was, but uh, I'd been working with him and, and um, for a while, and, and he, he he got his game geared back up and and, and played back out on the tour and uh, on the Champions Tour, and um, it was a pretty neat. It was actually a really neat deal. It was right here in Austin, and he's a local guy, and he'd been out of the arena for thirty plus years, and he he'd been kind of way off you know way off track with his game, and we'd worked together. Uh, he could probably tell you more about it than I could four or five years, and um, he got it all back. I mean, he got got to play in that arena again one more time, you know, and only golf you can do that. You didn't you didn't do that in the NBA and football and all those, you know, tennis or nothing. You, it's just he, – he, only golf you can do that. Well, he did. He, he got back in, and – and but uh, anyway, with that, he's he's been teaching. He taught for me for, for a long time and has always been a student, and uh, but he got stage four colon cancer, and um, – so with that being said, you know, it's been a long, it's, it's been a tough three, four months for Larry and uh, family and all that stuff. But uh, he's coming down here on Thursday and we're going to start, um, we're going to start a series where he, he, he just had surgery today to remove, and it was a successful surgery, which was, you know, a blessing in many ways. But uh, we're going to start a uh a YouTube series tracking him because he can't, he, he was the one that brought up to me, he goes, hey, I can't swing more than 15 yards right now anyway. He said, so why not, why don't we just, uh, why don't we just do something where we can show where I end up, you know, what that, you know, <laughs> you know, and that's saying something for somebody, you know, that's, that, that, that's got that going on. So uh, we're going to start literally, I, well, I don't know, if, I don't, I have no idea how where this is going to go, but we're going to start on Thursday and you'll see a video uh, with it where we're at now and i'm hoping that you know 10 years from 15 years from now we're still working on it um but the bottom line is we're going to start with it because that's all he's got he's got about 15 yards in the swing and i'm surprised he wants to do it personally i'm surprised he can do it and but that's all he got in his back so we're going to start there and we're going to show you and he was he was doing it for the online he he, he called me today and asked me about it and he said i just think it would benefit everybody in your program from two two aspects one that one this is all one all it's all i got we'll see where we end up and then two would be like from the mentality standpoint you know like you know showing you that you know you if the mind's right and you got your mindset right you're in the right spot i can show you with this program and if your mind's right but if your mind's all wandering you got the monkey mind you're not but you know with larry you know when you, you met what he's met in the last few months you know you get your mind right pretty quick and, and it gets simpler and that's what he's dealing with right now. And so I, he'll be an inspiration, I'm, I can assure you, for me. Um, but hopefully for everybody else as well. And we can track his progress, hopefully, in the next 
you know, next 10, 15 years or more, whatever it allows. But um, do you have any more questions? Well, we'll probably go ahead and wrap it up tonight. But uh, like I said, don't you know? Uh, don't be shy about sending in videos. Uh, just send them in, and, and we may start doing some of that as we move forward too uh, with swings and showing kind of where you're at and some of the things that I think you need to do so you can study your videos. I think that would be important. Uh, move if you can do them in uh, slow motion, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, but uh, you could send me both. Send them because sometimes the transition, the slow motion, doesn't pop up. So. However you want to send them, I'll look at them, and then maybe we can start adding some of those in on the webinars as we go along. And I'm supposed to talk about putting tonight, but I didn't get to it, so maybe we can do that next week too, or two weeks from now. But uh, appreciate your time, guys, and uh, look forward to seeing you here in a couple weeks. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Take care. Have a great one.